If you were to write the story of Seattle, one of boundless optimism and fearless ambition, of commerce and industry, decay and desecration, it would be perhaps fitting to use this typewriter in this room. Built in 1911, this mill stands as a monument to the faith that its founders placed in the Northwest as an industrial center. It was built on Harbor Island in 1911, and when it was booming, three million pounds of wheat rolled in the front door every day and exited out the back as flour. And what an appetite. Every day, Fishers grinds the annual average production of 2,500 acres of wheat land. It was an astonishing example of sheer possibility of what a cow town on the edge of nowhere could be. It is a tomb, a sprawling catacomb of emptiness and decay around every corner, on every wall, reminders. I'd be lying to you if I said it wasn't a little spooky in here. That this is a boneyard of industry, a place where old Seattle optimism and audacity wore out and curled up to die. from wheat to flour. In its heyday, business boomed for years, decades. What I saw at that time was a very busy milling operation with ships coming and going and, and cargo being loaded on two or three ships a day. But in 2001, Fisher got out of the flour business and sold the property to Pendleton Flour out of Portland. A year later, Pendleton put the site up for sale too. King County liked the water and rail access. So we purchased it to hold it as an option as we looked at alternatives for a solid waste disposal. If they needed to, they figured they could always put garbage on boats or trains here and send it away. But it turned out they didn't need to do that, and maybe they never will. The structures were completely abandoned, and for a long while they sat there, like a great museum, sealed up and frozen in time. It was as if the workers had just set down their gloves and walked out. In 2006, Dan Hawkins and some others snuck into the mill repeatedly to explore and photograph. These are some of his pictures. He says he loved it like this and in his own way tried to protect it. But see this television right here? This TV ran nonstop for over six years. But vandals discovered the mill and they ransacked the place. Chairs were thrown through windows, anything and everything knocked over, torn apart, violated. See all this? Yeah. All the copper's gone. And when they were finished, the copper thieves came and desecrated it further. All the while, Seattle thought the port should police the place and the port thought the SPD should police the place. Yeah, they've degraded the building uh, on a spiritual level and on a structural level to a degree that's it's painful to watch. And the landlord, King County, sat and watched with apparent disinterest. They still do. It's like some post-apocalyptic art gallery or something. It is a destination now for those who would inflict their artwork on that which is not theirs. Taggers show up from all over the West Coast to spray pictures, express themselves. The mill is their playground, and who's to stop them? Seattle's only graffiti detective already has his hands full. I have not got any complaints about any buildings on Harbor Island. It, if I did get complaints, I would look into it, though. It's been an ongoing challenge for us, providing adequate security out there that we continue to work on. There are those who wonder if abandonment or demolition are the only options. This would be a great performance space. This would be a great artist loft. This would be a great classroom. This would be a great movie hall. You name it. It's sad. I'm sorry. I hope that that will be, that they'll find a use for it and uh, be able to reconstruct that property and do a wonderful part of the Seattle community. You just don't want to see this go away. You, don't, you think it would be a waste. It'd be a total waste. And uh, anything but this. We are making money on it. It's not costing the rate pay or anything. It's an asset which could have great value in the future, so we continue to maintain it. On any given night, you can see them enter the once great mill. Explorers, some of them, 
Taggers, drug addicts, copper thieves, the curious, the angry, the disillusioned, having their way with the halls and walls and the soul of the place. How about the future, Mr. Fisher? The old dreams of a young city on the rise seem now like the quaint ramblings of an old man who nobody listens to anymore. And you wonder if this is how the story ends. Eric Johnson, Como 4 News. There's an old building and a door and a hole in a floor, and their existence nags at us like a whisper of guilt. Remember, they say, remember or repeat. We think we can imagine how it was then after Pearl Harbor, but unless we were there, alive and breathing, angry and scared, we have no idea. Would the Japanese land in a week? Would the United States exist in a year? Only this was known. The whole world was coming unglued. I've had an exciting life. I think it's been a good life. Mary Matsuda was 17 years old. The emotion that swirled around that time is truly understandable. This is war. And so in the aftermath, decisions were made. Decisions that in the hysteria of the moment seemed logical. Decisions that in time would become stains on the conscience of a great nation. Tens of thousands, citizens of Japanese descent, were yanked from their homes and sent away on buses to internment camps. Lost in the fog of war, of course, was the fact that they were Americans. We were told that we would have to leave on May 16th. So we had eight days. They were each allowed two suitcases. How do you pack a lifetime into two suitcases? Or 120,000 lifetimes? And the Panama Hotel on South Main Street stood silent witness to it all. So, you know, the question becomes, well, what do you take? We did the best we could. I took a Bible. Um, and of course, we took our eating utensils, plate, bowl, cup. Someone asked Takashi Hori, the owner of the Panama Hotel, if they could leave some belongings in the basement, the stuff they couldn't take to the camps. He said yes. Word spread in the frantic, frenzied rush of the moment. The basement of the hotel filled up with trunks, boxes stuffed full of lives put on hold. The miracle of the Panama Hotel is they are still there today. I think it's something that needs to stay here in, in American history. It's very much a teaching tool. It is exactly as it was. Some Japanese Americans returned for their belongings after the war, but some had died, some had moved on, many never came back to the basement. And so their trunks remained just kind of passing through the caretaker. Jan Johnson bought the place in 1983. She runs the hotel, considers the place a living museum. It's as if 70 years never happened. I don't know why I do it. I have a different answer every day. It's, uh, I don't know. The soul of the Panama Hotel is in the basement. The hole in the floor is for the world to peek down into the sacred place to see what prejudice and panic look like. This is all everyday life stuff. And you, then you really start to think about why this is here and how people's lives, Americans' lives, were uprooted from their homes. Some years ago, the Japanese American National Museum went through most of the trunks, documented the contents, and put them back. They rest there still, covered now in bubble wrap, surrounded by the stuff of life. A set of golf clubs, a box of fishing tackle, Please. portraits of Americans whose names are lost to time. Ooh. And the tools of an artist. Wow. Do you, uh, you feel ghosts in here? I think I am one. There is one trunk, though, the one you see from the hole in the floor above that no one, not even Jan, has ever gone through. I will try and lift it. And where am I gonna put it? 
until now. Carefully, we open the lid and peer into lives unknown. Oh, okay. To see what they treasured. There is a souvenir pillow from a distant day trip to Mount Rainier. This is a little purse with initials on it in metal. Wow. It's a coat. It's a bathing suit. It contains articles of people who wanted to save them. So to put those things in the basement of the Panama Hotel indicated their sense of, of faith and hope that something that was precious to them would endure over time. So, yes, it is, I think, a sacred place. Time heals, they say. Pain slips away like half-remembered dreams. But there is a place, hallowed ground, really, where time is frozen and pain is boxed up, piled high like the hopes of generations. It is the Panama Hotel, where a hole in the floor nags at us, like a whisper of guilt. Eric Johnson, Como 4 News. It lurks in the water like a menace, a hazard, like some kind of black yellow log. And children, they cry as bodies drop from the sky, tossed by what is known as the blob. They were drawn to the ladder as if in a trance, little Johnny and Susie and Bobby. And one step at a time, they stand there in line to get thrilled, chilled, and blobby. They crawl to the end of the big puffy pillow and sit there like so much cannon fodder and wait for a child to make the call of the wild. Beware of the blob. A dropping, plopping, free falling blobber. What goes down must send something up a launch, a heave, a lob. Children descending, splashes impending, catapulted by the blob. Scared? It's my birthday tomorrow. For a moment they are weightless and flying, high above the ooing and awing mob, twisting and turning, arms and legs churning, courtesy, the kid spewing blob. It burps out little boys and spits out little girls, and it belches and groans and slobbers when not one but two of them stand at the top. Oh, the much dreaded double blobbers. Three, two, one! He went really, really high. That is so cool. And the sound that they make as they wait to partake is neither yelp nor squeal nor sob. It's a howl of wonder, the sound of summer, the cacophony of joy from the blob. One day when they're old and not nearly so bold, working at their nine to five job, They'll dream of the day they were young and at play being shot from the mouth of the blob. Bobby. Beware of the blob, it creeps and leaps and does and slides across the floor. Hey. Hey.